What a great audience. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not in the least bit intimidating. Um, Mark, yeah. thank you very much indeed. Uh, it is a huge, huge privilege uh, to be here with uh, these two gentlemen on the stage. Um, it, it's sometimes said that the Secretary General of the United Nations is, uh, is described as a secular pope. And if that's the case, we have in this room uh, two senior archbishops. <laughs> let, 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 what about cardinals? Okay, cardinals. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so so let's. Um, uh, Mark has already introduced both uh, Jeffrey Feltman and Michael Keating. Um, Jeffrey Feltman, former UN Under Secretary uh, General for Political Affairs, which, which I think essentially means that you are the Secretary General's deputy. Is that is that right? If if the UN was a country, you would be the Foreign Minister. That's that's. That's right. But the okay, not so a there we are. There we are. It's lots of countries. So, yeah. um, and and Michael Keating, you are the uh, the Secretary General's UN Special Representative for Somalia, and you've also worked in Afghanistan and done many other things. Um, uh, Jeffrey Feltman, let's uh, let's start with you because your your career goes back to um, being a very distinguished uh, member of the U.S. Foreign Service. So you've been a, U a U.S. diplomat for a very long time, three, three decades before you moved to the United Nations. And, and given that the United Nations we know has had and currently has a, a very tricky relationship with the United States, with the current uh, incumbent in the White House, um, I, I wonder how you would describe the difference between being a UN diplomat and a US diplomat? Raja, thanks for the question because it's one that I thought about a lot during the six years I, have, I had the honor to serve the UN. And first of all, let me, let me thank the Beyond Borders people and, and, and Mark Miller Stewart for inviting me here. This is my first time um, at Tracare House, um, first time at Beyond Borders. It's great. Um, let me say that when I joined the UN about just over six years ago, when I was appointed by Ban Ki-moon into the, to the position I had, I underestimated the differences. You know, I'd served as a US diplomat um, for, for about three decades. I thought, OK, I know the diplomatic tradecraft. Um, this is going to be easy. It wasn't. It was much, much more different. I really underestimated the differences. Uh, you know, on the one hand, I, I sort of joked with my former State Department colleagues, and I said, you know, the, the UN has made me discover just how nimble and flexible the US State Department is. <laughs> and, and those were not. And those were not words I used when I worked for the State Department. Um, but, the, but the value of the UN is the diversity that the UN, that the UN itself has within. You know, when I, as Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, I would call my senior staff together to talk about the world's problems. Um, we were dealing with the political issues, the, the conflict issues we'll talk about. And the world was at the conference table. You know, the people around that conference table, one of my Africa um, advisors had been a child soldier in, Mo in his native country of Mozambique fighting the Portuguese. That's not an experience you get sitting around the NSC table in Washington. You know, the, so the diversity of experience was really, was really rich. But in terms of the difference, when you go in as a US diplomat, um, whether you think about it or not, you have almost an invisible backpack of the national interests and power of the United States. Um, there's the Pentagon, the White House, the veto power at the Security Council, the voting weight at the IMF or the World Bank. It's tangible stuff that's in your toolkit. When you go in as a, as a UN representative, and Michael can talk about this um, from his perspective on the ground, where I, was, where I was doing it from headquarters, as a UN diplomat, you have a toolkit too, but that toolkit tends to be ideals, principles, the charter. Those aren't tangible. They're important. They represent um, the vision that the, 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 the founders of the UN had for the organization. But they aren't tangible the same way that the Pentagon, the currency, is tangible, which means that you have to spend much more time building consensus um, than you do as a US diplomat. As a US diplomat, you may want consensus, but eventually you can say, oh, phooey, I'm tired of this. I'm just, we're just going to go ahead. UN, you can't do that. You need to build consensus all the time with member states, with civil society. But once you have that consensus, no member state, no matter how powerful, has the same legitimacy. Uh, Mike, Michael, let's, let's just get you to, to describe a little bit of what that's like on the ground. I mean, you've been the special representative to Somalia now for how long? Uh, coming up for three years. Okay, two, three two years. years, nine months. Yeah. So Somalia has seen decades of conflict, uh, although there has been some uh, 
transition to a government through elections recently, there is still also unbelievable tension and security is very volatile. Al-Shabaab hasn't been destroyed, etc. So how does, how does that work on the ground when you are attempting to represent the member states of the United Nations? Well, let me also begin by thanking Beyond Borders for inviting me here. And I'm here under false pretenses, because I think I was invited because a book is coming out in <laughs> November on Somalia, of which I am the co-editor. But unfortunately, it's coming out till November, but it's available on Amazon already. Um, so thank you <laughs> for inviting plan. me. And well I'm done. sorry <laughs> that I haven't got the book ready. Before answering your question, I just want to react to something that Jeff said. You know, funny enough, if, you are, if you're lucky enough to be the head of a UN mission in the field, you've got enormous freedom of maneuver and movement. Actually, it's almost the opposite of you in New York. Mm -hmm. And the biggest challenge, in a way, is how to interpret your job, because you're given this extraordinary mandate, the Secretary General's representative, and then you've got all these relationships, and you've got a country that obviously has a lot of problems. Well, how how are you going to play that role? And wh where are you going to put your energy? And how are you going to build on the talent of the team that you have around you? And I think Jeff's hitting it. The most important thing is, is particularly in a country where there are very few institutions, where no one trusts each other, where everybody feels that they've been a victim of the war, uh, where no one trusts the army or the police force. Uh, the question is building the relationships, including with international actors, including those who have clout in the World Bank or IMF or in the Security Council, in order to get things done on the ground. Uh, and on the one hand, it's very important to recognize that ultimately, in a place like Somalia, but it applies elsewhere, the solutions have to be their own. They have to sort out their own problems. You can't want to sort out problems more than the people who are a victim of them themselves. So it's a question of, of creating safe spaces in which Somalis, in my case, can talk to each other, bringing experience from other parts of the world you know, to bear and suggesting ways in which they can try and address these problems, whether it's dealing with al-Shabaab, whether it's building a trusted security force, whether it's fighting corruption, whether it's organizing an electoral process, whether it's responding to a famine, you know, creating the space say, so how do you think this can be done, and how can we help you do that? And it's a bit of a game, because on the one hand, it's very important that agency is primarily with Somalis, but given how fragmented the country is and how much distrust there is, having the support of the international community becomes incredibly important. So a big part of my job is trying to knit together coalitions of international actors and increasingly, those aren't just the ones you expect, the US and Europe and, and the rich ones. You have to pay more and more attention to emerging middle-sized powers like Turkey and the Emirates and the Saudis, the Ethiopians, and try and create a consensus among them about how to support the Somalis to get things done. Well, not least because those countries that you mentioned would have their own agendas in that And country. they have their own agenda. But I think 10 years ago, and Jeff can speak to this much more than I can, I'd like to think that if you spoke to a couple of superpowers, you could probably f influence the behavior of many other actors. But increasingly, that doesn't work. I mean, everybody's doing their own thing. You know, the Turks and the Saudis and the Emiratis and everybody else has their own agenda. And you may or may not be able to influence it by talking to Washington or Brussels or even, you know, Beijing. Mm. So it's a much more complicated environment, you know, in which you've got to try and bring international actors together around an agenda that the Somalis themselves uh, are crafting uh, while recognizing that their ability to do that is, is actually limited. So it's a, it's a respectful, in a way, discussion with them. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to some of the detail of what you've just outlined. Uh, uh, Je Jeffrey Feltman, though, let, let's let's look at um, the the sorts of challenges that the United Nations faces. So, obviously, it's better to prevent conflict yes. and to avoid wars breaking out left, right, and centre. But let's talk about conflict resolution, since there are so many conflicts that uh, that the UN is having to deal with. And 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 I want to focus, if we can, just a, a little bit on 
on Syria and and Yemen. So with with Yemen, the easy I, ones. Yeah, let's let's deal with the easy ones. Get those out of the way, and then we yeah. can we can have a nice time. Um, so let's start with Yemen because uh, you appointed the most recent. Uh, envoy who is engaged in uh, attempting to bring the the sides together to, to at least talk Martin Griffiths um, wh where where do you think where do you think we're at with that because I've certainly done interviews with representatives of Houthis who have said well we're not interested in talking to Martin Griffiths and yet the UN presents a picture of the potential for some movement uh, Yemen is a is a good example, you could say bad example, of constraints on the UN's ability to resolve conflicts because of the sharp differences between member states. Um, in general, the UN does not pick winners or losers. That's unlike, that's unlike member states. Member states may want a certain party to win or a certain party to lose, and the UN simply wants to prevent or resolve, con or resolve conflict. Um, and that clashes with that clashes at times with member states. You look at the, the Michael mentioned that he gets the mandate from the Secretary General. How does he interpret that? Well, part of it is what the Security Council says, and what the Security Council says Martin Griffith's job is based on the resolution that was that was passed soon after the 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 Yemen war started is to get the Houthis to withdraw from Sana'a, to turn over all their armed weapons, and to restore the status quo ante that was there before the Houthis moved into Sana'a. That's Martin Griffith's mandate, uh, as defined by the Security Council. It's a very one-sided mandate. It's basically saying, surrender and then talk. It's, because it's, the United Nations recognizes the government that the Saudi coalition the, the is, is fighting to re restore. That's right. So it's not, a, it's, it's, it's frankly not a realistic mandate on which to build a negotiation. Um, so Martin has a real challenge, which is first how to convince the, the, the Houthis that he himself is open for the listening. He himself is open to try to, to put down ideas on the table. And then how do you persuade the Security Council members who passed that resolution that he's not undermining the resolution because he's talking to the Houthis, he's setting up a negotiation process that's not exactly in line with what that Security Council resolution that was passed several years ago that's not realistic for basic negotiations says. Um, the other thing that Martin has been doing, of course, is trying to, trying to broker understandings regarding the, the just dreadful humanitarian, the, the humanitarian catastrophe. How do you maintain access? How do you, how do you um, um, prevent a military strike against the port of Hudaydah through which 70 or 80 percent of the imports to Yemen go? Um, cutting off um, access to health health care and all of that. So he has been concentrating on that, um, which means that the larger picture of ending the war becomes, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say secondary, but, but, but there's a distraction there. Now, one would hope that, that his negotiations on the humanitarian access issues will lead to the type of credibility he needs with all the parties to move into the, into the, to the broader, broader picture. But it's really tough when you have strong member states with influence on the ground who push in a way that's different from what would be a realistic negotiating process. Okay, so in, in which case we have to really talk about the sphere of influence for Saudi Arabia, since it is a coalition yes. that is being led by Saudi Arabia. And, and, and I, I, I wonder then to what extent you think it's as important for the United Nations then to, to react to an incident, the recent incident of the Saudis bombing um, the the bus that was carrying the school children and more than 30 school children were were killed and the saudis continue to defend that as a legitimate target I, I, how does the united nations then respond if it is involved in talks when what the saudi coalition is doing is actually trying to implement a un resolution which is to restore the legitimate government of yemen I don't think the UN has any choice but to but to speak out against such in, such incidents. You know the um, the and I think the UN has been clear that the Saudi-led coalition and the Saudis don't even like us say, don't like the UN saying the Saudi-led coalition. They just want to call it a coalition. But the Saudi-led coalition has um, whether it's 
whether it's sloppiness by mistakes, whatever it is, but they have, they, they have had an excessive amount of casualties from their military acts among civilians by their military action. I think that when you look at the High Commissioner for Human Rights, you look at the Secretary General, um, you look at the statements that, that, that Martin Griffiths and his predecessors have given to the Security Council, I think the UN has a, has a strong record of pointing out um, the appalling levels of casualties in this war. I mean, it's a, it's a horrible and stupid war. And if you look at the, what were the Saudi goals, the Saudi-led coalition goals, of this war, I mean, yes, it was in the Security Council resolution to to um, respond to what had been a a Houthi takeover of Sanaa, um, to respond to the Houthis basically throwing out the results in which they had participated from the national dialogue process and take and taking what they didn't get on the t on the negotiating table by force. It's to you know to respond to that, but it was also ostensibly to prevent Iranian influence inside. Um, Yemen, Iranian influence today is far greater. We can argue over how, how deep it is, but it's far greater now than it was before this war started. It was to prevent um, a, a Hezbollah-type um, militia being able to operate against Saudi Arabia from across the, across the border. Without question, the Houthis are much more powerful militarily now than they were before this war started. Is you know the, the Saudis need to ask themselves if continuation of this appalling war is really achieving the goals that they themselves set out. I, I, I wonder, though, if, if what, what you're saying really goes to the heart of uh, challenging the, the role of the UN in, in geopolitics, in world affairs. You know, do you sense that there is, uh, because of the way in which politics is conducted, not least by President Trump, that, that there is a marginalization of the United Nations that's going on in the world now that, that makes it far more impotent than it ever was before. I mean, I think that there's a real risk to the United Nations by, the, by some of the Trump policies, by the skepticism that goes far beyond Trump, that's in the global north and the global south, about the current world order, about the institutions that we've, that we've all inherited over, that have been, that have been built over the last you know, 70 plus years, I think that there's a real risk to the United Nations from this, from the, the fatigue, the skepticism, the populism, what, you know, define it as you, ha as you have it. And I think there's another risk to the UN, and it's one that I've been trying to grapple with in my post-UN retirement. I think that the UN um, has, been, uh, has been effective in a number of conflict situations that none of you have thought about. I think the UN has done a very good job in preventing conflicts or in participating in the prevention of conflicts. If a conflict didn't happen, I'm not sure how you define who and you know who was directly responsible for preventing it. But in, there's a lot of places in West Africa, the transition in Burkina Faso, the the transition in the Gambia, these these things could have turned into civil war. And the UN participated in preventing these from becoming conflicts. But the problem is, if the UN is only effective in places where the great powers aren't paying attention or don't care, the UN doesn't look that important to the same powers that, that the UN needs to stay engaged and stay involved. And so I think it's a problem. So yes, I think the UN has been effective in many, many places. Um, but how to turn that into a story that makes the UN compelling for capitals today is a, is a challenge. Well, well let, let's talk about one of the points that Maya made in the, in the previous session when she talked about the, the, the lesson to take away from, from Conrad is that to, to remind us always that what happens over there will make an impact over here and the connectedness of the, of the world in that yes. way. When you, when you look at what's happening in Syria, one of the reasons why it, I mean, it's important in and of itself, it's been a brutal, brutal civil war for many years now, but but the impact of what's happened inside Syria, inside the domestic internal politics of the country, has had a huge impact on Europe. In the same mm -hmm. way that, of course, in African countries, the conflicts inside African countries have had a huge impact in Europe in terms of refugees. I, I want to talk a little bit about refugees and the way in which the United Nations manages 
what is what feels like a, it, it is. It's a it's a global issue, but it's also an issue that is making a major impact in in nation states and the way in which they're responding to it makes the job much harder for the UN. Well, I think that um, one of the issues on the peace and security side, that's the side of the UN that I, that, that I was involved in, is that when we have a special envoy, special representative of the Secretary General, we have a mission set up by the Security Council. It's a country-specific mission. It's a country-specific envoy in general. Um, but most of these conflicts are no longer confined to one country. They may have started in one country, but then they're exacerbated by you know, a proxy war effect. They have an impact that goes far beyond the borders. But yet, for example, take our, our colleague and friend, Stefan de Mistura, who's been very wisely advised by um, Mark Mueller over the years. His, his, his um, mandate is Syria. But do we really think that a Syria-only focus will end the Syria war or deal with the consequences of the Syria war. No, you have to expand beyond Syria. Um, but to do that, since the Security Council mandate is only for Syria, you have to then work in a way that the other states that need to be part of the solution want to engage you. Because you don't have any force. You can't, you can't if the door is locked to a UN envoy, you can't, you can't break it down. You have to, you have to um, find a way to work with the other states beyond your mandate in this day and age. And I think Michael has done a very, very good job in Somalia because, again, Somalia, is not going, Somalia has, to, has to have a Somalia solution, as Michael first said, but others have to enable the environment in which that can take place. And Michael's done a very good job of taking his Somalia-specific mandate and bringing in the, the region, the, the Arab countries, Turkey, and, and beyond. Well, let's, to, let's talk about what's the, uh, Somalia as, a, uh, as an example of this, because one of the things that's happened is that the fight against al-Shabaab has resulted in the African Union and the special forces in the African Union really uh, de trying to deal with al-Shabaab on the ground. But that's had a knock-on effect in that Al-Shabaab has then, Kenya is part of the African Union forces trying to fight Al-Shabaab. They have attacked Kenya and so on and so on. I mean, I, I just wonder what, what role the UN plays in, in that context, because you talk a lot about, you know, bringing people together. Well, uh, I think what you're talking about is how do you reduce violence and find political solutions acceptable to all Somalis as well as to the region. Mm. And the role that we've tried to play, including my predecessor, but certainly over the last couple of years, is to, I mean, it sounds trite, but it's this basic, is to try and improve people's understanding of the nature and dynamics of the conflict. And the minute you spend more than 10 minutes thinking about that, you realize that this isn't just about a fight against al-Shabaab. This is a society that has multiple layers of conflict over resources, over revenues, over a sense of injustice, over marginalization, over foreign actors wanting to exploit things. And into that mix, you have a virulent ideological group, uh, al-Shabaab, uh, which is not just an ideological group, it's also a mafia. So, and once you begin to understand those dynamics and understand, well, why do young people go and join al-Shabaab? And why do businesses continue to pay taxes to al-Shabaab? What is it that's leading to this? Then you begin to see the contours of a a political, you know, political approaches. And I think the point I would make is that one of the things that I'm most fearful of is the notion that you deal with violent extremism by drop, dropping hellfire missiles on, on, you know, on, on insurgents. That ain't going to work. But it's still happening. But it's still happening. And that begs the question, why does it happen? What are the dynamics that continue to result in countries wanting to pursue that as an option. Is it something to do with the political economy of conflict in the, in the world? And that actually speaks, to, I think, to something that Jeff said, that you know, so many of these conflicts, the, the international dimension to them, the role of dark money, the role of the arms trade, the role of the drugs trade, and trying to solve problems on a country-by-country -country basis without addressing these much, much bigger things, I think is impossible. But the, quid, the, the, the other side of that in terms of what we've tried to do in Somalia, with your help, and I hope this doesn't descend into a mutual admiration society, but I couldn't <laughs> have had a better boss than Jeff, is what we've tried to do is to say to the Russians, I mean, I went to Moscow, and I've you know, gone to Washington, I've gone to all the capitals of the major players, and said, listen, 
We know you've got differences in Yemen. We know you've got differences in Libya. Can we just have one little place on the planet where maybe because it isn't top of your list, you can work together? And I wouldn't say we've won that argument, but we've got a little bit of space in terms of things like getting them to cooperate and building um, you know, uh, a police force and an army. I mean, this is modest stuff, mm. but you can use you know, a country situation in which to try and address some of these things to the degree that your limited toolbox at that, you know, uh, uh, that geographically confined level uh, allows. Yeah. To, to, to what extent, though, then, um, Jeffrey, does um, does what the United States policy now towards the United Nations? I mean, Nikki Haley has talked about uh, the the reduction of the budget that the U.S. gives to the United Nations, which is what President Trump wants. I mean, we're, we're talking about billions of of dollars that he doesn't think is being spent wisely enough. And although you could argue that the United States isn't the world's policeman anymore. In fact, it is probably just Donald Trump is the world's policeman if he decides he wants to say something on Twitter and that will happen. I just wonder to what extent you think that the United Nations is losing that battle in trying to maintain itself as a kind of cohesive moral arbiter that has the budget to, to, to try and do the things that it's trying to do in the world. I'm not sure the United Nations is ever going to feel it has the budget to do what it, what it wants to do in the world. You know, it's just that's the nature of bureaucracies. You know, you always think that you, you, can, you need more resources, and I certainly, as the head of the Department of Political Affairs, always thought I needed more resources to do, to do and various And you don't things. think the United Nations um, should be just made much more efficient? Uh, I, you know, there's a, there's, there is some efficiency that can be made, but, it's not, but that's, not, that's not what we're talking about. Um, I, I think that... I mean, the U.S. has taken some decisions that, that as a U.S. citizen and as a former U, um, U.N. senior official, I deeply lament. I, 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 I decry the cutting off of funding for the Palestinian refugees through, through UNRWA, through the, the withdrawal of the Paris Climate Accord, the withdrawal from the, from the um, JCPOA, the Iran nuclear agreement. I, I, I'm, I'm appalled by that as a, as a U.S. citizen, and I also think as a U.S. citizen that we need, we as Americans need to recognize that the challenges that, that all of us face are challenges that a single country alone is not well addressed to meet. It's much better to meet these challenges collectively, whether we're talking about building a healthy climate or working against pandemics or finding a way that migration benefits people. You know, these are things that you need a multilateral approach to. So I believe strongly that, that we still need the United Nations. And one of the things I want to do in my retirement is try to explain to my fellow American citizens why I, as a former UN insider, what I saw and why I think it's in our, our interest to maintain support. But in general, um, despite all of the Trump rhetoric about uh, about multilateralism with the exceptions that I cited at the beginning of my remarks the US has maintained its support for the United Nations and for most of the agency's funds and programs um, I hope that continues um, there are times when I sat in the Security Council one of the privileges that I had in my illustrious predecessor Sir Kiernan whose, whose pictures on the wall one of the privileges you have as Under Secretary General for Political Affairs is you can sit at the Security Council. You, you don't vote, but you can sit at the, at the horseshoe. And I would hear sometimes Nikki Haley talk about going to South Sudan, and I'd be sort of, I would marvel, because it could be Samantha Power's remarks. Well, that's astonishing. You know, that, that she would start off giving a human interest story about, about women or children that she had seen in South Sudan and the suffering they had done, and then move toward the fact that the, that the um, Security Council should come together around an arms embargo against insurgents in South Sudan, whatever it was. But there were some times when there was more continuity than than I would have expected. The discussion about the discussions on Ukraine, on Russia's role in Ukraine, um, were also very similar. Now, obviously, that doesn't that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict a big difference. Iran, Iran, um, obviously, there was a big difference. But there was more continuity than I would have expected. And there's still, so far, um, I think it's because of a very good relationship that Antonio Guterres, the current Secretary General, has developed with Nikki Haley and with the, and with the US Congress. So far, in general, the US is still providing its support, political and financial, to the UN, with the exceptions that I mentioned that I do lament. I just yeah, one of course. Thing, you know? 
Every time there's a job going in the UN, the number of people apply for it is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't know how how you measure the relevance of the UN, but if it's in terms of people who want wanting to work for it, it's not irrelevant. And I would also think, Jeff, that being the UN ambassador to the UN is still most countries' top diplomatic posting, not or one of the top it's two or three. So, you know, before we kind of write off the relevance of the UN, it seems that it has a sure, gravitational uh, it, Yeah, but you could argue, just to be devil's advocate for a yeah. moment, you could argue that the numbers of people who apply for a, a UN job is because lots of people hear about it being this really cushy job with, you know, being paid really well, living, living well in a very, very poor country. I mean, there is that perception, right? I mean, I'm not saying something that okay. is, is completely without, um, without any foundation. People yeah, do maybe. think that. Well, yeah, you, you, you know, you get a proper salary, it's true, but it's not, <laughs> it's not exactly cushy, I don't think. No. no. Let, let's, let's, I want to pick up on the, some of the points that Jeffrey's made about, um, about the perception of, of the UN. So on the ground, what what do people what do people think about the UN the UN's presence in a country like Somalia? What do Somalis think of it? I mean, uh, a lot of the Somali politicians have themselves been in the UN, and actually, this is a role that the UN plays around the world that people often don't pick up on, is that it's almost an incubator for politicians and officials in many, many countries. I mean, I don't know how many heads of government and heads of state in the world are ex-UN officials, but I imagine quite a lot of them. Uh, they do tend to think of the UN as somewhat distant because we're in our white vehicles and living in compounds, and we don't want to be living in, arm you know, in compounds in armored vehicles. We'd actually much, more, much prefer to be living you know, uh, in town with people, but the security situation doesn't allow it. Uh, I would like to think, judging by my Twitter feed, that on balance, even though there's a lot of criticism of the UN abuse, I think the feeling is that thank goodness that there is someone trying to be somewhat of a neutral referee in the very uh, kind of semi-cutthroat world of Somali politics. And I think that's, if that is the case, I think that's an extraordinarily valuable role to be, to be playing, mm. you know, absent institutions and absent uh, many capacities to get things done. If the UN is seen as trustable and trying to do the right thing, that, that's big. Let, let, let's, uh, we, we didn't uh, talk about Syria, Jeffrey. We kind of skirted over it. But I, I just want to talk a little bit about um, to, to what extent you think the, first of all, whether the war is over and whether we can assume that it's Damascus that has won. I'm, and I ask that question, it's not, it's not as obvious a question as it might seem, because it does feel as though Syria as a country will not be the same Syria mm -hmm. that it was before 2011, when the civil war, when the uprising started and, and, and turned into a civil war, because it does, it does on one level feel like there are no winners in that war. Well, the Syrian people certainly aren't, the, aren't uh, it's hard to point to the Syrian people and say any of them are winners at this point. I think that the, the, the bulk of the war is over, and I think that, uh, um, that Damascus, with the support of, of Tehran and Moscow, has won. But you're absolutely right, it's not going to be the Syria that was there before 2011, and there may be, and there are probably going to be pockets of, pockets of Syria that remain out of the control of the government. There'll probably be a different relationship with the, with the Kurdish parts of the country than there were before 2011. I, but I, I do think that we need to be thinking about um, a post-war scenario in a, in a less than stable Syria rather than a Syria at war at this point. Um, and I, I'm just, it's, appall it's appalling to look at um, what we now accept as normal because of this, because of this, largely because of the Syria war, it's, although it's happened in Somalia and Yemen and elsewhere. But the fact that um, you, you look back to the first time there were reports of chemical weapons attacks in Syria. I think everybody was appalled. Everybody was, you know. August 2012. Yes, everybody was just absolutely appalled. Now you read about chlorine attacks, and it's like, well, oh, hmm. Um, you read about, um, you, read, you read about, or have, have people who bear witness to um, communities that have been starved, that they've been starved into surrender. These are, these are medieval tactics. You know, what's happened to the, um, human rights agenda global? What have happened to human rights standards? What have happened to the, to the ideas of protection of humanitarian workers, protection of medical staff? 
all of, it's not just the Syrian people that have become victims of this war, it's the international standards have become victims of this, of this war. And I would like to, like to think that the United Nations, that the member states in the United Nations will be able to draw lessons from the Syrian war that are not only Syria specific, but that would revive um, the standards that we should all be living with in conflict situations. The rules of war, um, and it's terrible to talk about rules of war to begin with, but rules of war have been, have been completely eroded by what's, hap by what's happened in Syria. And, and do you think that as a result of the, that having taken place, that there will, be, there will be repercussions? I mean, President Assad is still there. Many countries wrote him off very early on, um, immediately after the uprising, in fact, called for him to step down and so on. And yet now the world is going to have to deal with with President Assad, and, and I, wonder, I wonder how the post-war reconstruction is going to work, because it's quite unlikely, given the things that people have said about him in Western countries, that European Union capitals are going to throw money into Syria for mm -hmm. reconstruction, whether the United States will, and it's quite questionable whether Russia is going to feel that it will bear the burden of, of reconstruction. I mean, I think that Russia, um and the Iran, although Iran plays a, plays a different role, will want the world to provide funds for reconstruction of Syria. I don't think Russia and, and Iran are going to want to be the ones um, doing that solely. And I think that's, I think it's that- It's unlikely that Iran will that have Ser any money. <laughs> I think that Sergei Lavrov's trip to New York a couple days ago um, to see sec the Secretary General was in part to try to get the United Nations more focused on on reconstruction, to get the United Nations to be the ones promoting reconstruction and trying to generate funds for reconstruction. I'm no longer in the United Nations, so I, I, I don't know what, what the, current, the current discussions are, but I, I would hope that there is some linkage to accountability um, over the atrocities that have taken place over the, over the past six years, six, seven years. I would hope that there's um, some linkage to the type of of inclusive, pol inclusive political um, process that Stefan de Maistre, again with uh, Mark Moeller's advice, has been promoting, has been promoting valiantly but unsuccessfully for so long. I, I don't believe that any that the major donors are going to simply open their pocketbooks books, um, with no conditionality. So if the UN does get into this game, I hope the UN helps set the conditionality um, for reconstruction. But I don't know, the Russians are gonna, uh, the Russians, I predict, will, will put a lot of pressure on Antonio Guterres to get behind a reconstruction effort. Let's uh, open up the questions to the floor. There's a hand that's gone up there, so let's go there first, and the hand at the back, a gentleman in the blue shirt. Hi, um, my name's Ben Emerson. I was, uh, until very recently, yes. the UN Special Rapporteur on counterterrorism and human rights. And for those who don't understand the distinction, um, the gentleman on the stage both, I, I hope you don't mind me saying, civil servants for the UN in the sense that you work for the organization, whereas the special rapporteurs are independent of the organization and appointed by the Human Rights Council. So there's a, there's a difference in function between the two. I just wanted to know how, how much you uh, find the, the human rights agenda of the special rapporteurs or the office of the high commissioner uh, an obstacle to the rail politic pursued by the dpa and in particular i mean for example in situations which are not hot conflicts so dpa department for political, political affairs, affairs. Yeah, the department yes, yes, i yes, i, yes. I had it. i'm sorry my my, my 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 fault um i mean in situations which are not hot conflicts but for example in sri lanka where there's a frozen conflict situation going on or in Saudi Arabia, two countries on which I produced pretty hostile reports earlier this year. I mean, my, my sense is that that doesn't necessarily make the, the, the practical job of DPA any easier. And I wondered how you resolve those two competing dynamics, or to what extent they are competing. There's, there's, I mean, Ben, I, 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 I worked less with the special rapporteurs, but very closely with OHCHR. 
Um, and in fact, we have the Assistant Secretary General for OHCHR. This was the Office of the, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, you know, um, Prince Zaid, who's, who's just ending his, his tenure in Geneva. His, his Assistant Secretary General, Andrew Gilmer, is here in the audience. But I don't, think there was a, I don't think there was any UN official I spoke to more regularly and more deeply at my level than, than, than Prince Zaid, than the High Commissioner for Human Rights. He and I were often comparing notes on places like Sri Lanka. Uh, on places like the, how are the Saudis dealing with the eastern province? You know, did, were, did we have the same analysis? What we're going, we, we would try to coordinate our recommendations to the Secretary General. We would try to coordinate our statements to the Security Council so that they could, so that they couldn't play off the, polit the politics versus human rights. That these things were linked. Um, that you can't, you can't. Um, ignore the human rights situation and believe you can come up with a viable, sustainable political solution for a conflict or pre-conflict situation. Now, I didn't speak up on it in the same way that, that Zaid did. He was um, incredibly outspoken. Zaid was incredibly outspoken, incredibly courageous, incredibly, you know, the, the, the integrity of his statements, I think, is, you know, the, it's, they're irreproachable. I mean, he's, he's, been, he's been fantastic as an advocate for human rights um, everywhere. Um, so I did, not, I did not see my role as being a lesser human rights commissioner. My role was, was more direct on the political side, but the political side had to take into account what were the human rights practices. You know, there was, a, there was an initiative that the previous Secretary General, um, Ban Ki-moon, put in response to the UN's failures after Sri Lanka. Um, called Human Rights Up Front, and again, Andrew, Andrew Gilmore was one, and Michael Keating, in fact, these were, the, these were two of the strongest advocates for the Secretariat adopting a Human Rights Up Front perspective. And it meant that we needed to put, to use a stupid phrase, but we needed to mainstream human rights into all the elements of UN work, um, and to use human rights as, as one of the criteria of, do we need now to start thinking about conflict prevention in a particular country, because human rights um, abuses are early warning signs of, of potential atrocities. Um, so there's been much more sensitivity inside the, inside the Secretariat, and certainly inside the Department of Political Affairs under, under my, during my tenure, to human rights, because you can't, you can't come up with a, with a sustainable political solution that's going to work if you're ignoring the human rights situation. Again, I didn't work that closely with the special rapporteurs in part because it was to respect your independence. Thank you. Do you have a microphone? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my question is sort of the, the opposite of the previous question. Um, you talked about as a UN diplomat, you bring with you the ideas and values of the UN and that sort of thing, but you've also talked about the erosion of some of these principles. Um, one of these principles that's popped up over the past dozen years or so is the responsibility to protect. From an academic perspective, it seemed like a really radical development. But I'm wondering whether you, from a practical, a, a, a practical experience, think this is having real effect on the ground at all. I think it's having an effect on how the UN thinks about problems. I, don't, I, I would like to say it's having a real positive impact on the ground. I don't know that's the case. Um, and it's because of the sovereignty issue. You know, this, this is the real n heart of the problem the UN has with conflict prevention, or even conflict resolution, which is sovereignty. Um, member states are jealous of their sovereignty. Um, and we, we may all be able to discuss here where we see a country, um, an area that has a problem, a domestic problem that could easily turn into a conflict. But that doesn't mean that that country wants to see us all appear um, at its borders to say, hey, we're here to help. You know, we, have, we have expertise to offer. We can give you best practices. Um, and mentioning the responsibility to protect has become shorthand in too many countries for, ah, another excuse for the global north to interfere in the affairs of the global south. Um, so it's, it's become a... It, the, I've, for example, I did not use that terminology in my Security Council briefings. Even if I was talking about trying to find ways to, for the UN to help, help protect civilians, I didn't use the responsibility to protect terminology in my the political briefings for fear of immediately attracting opposition to whatever it was that we were proposing. So I think it's a very important concept. I think it's radical, like you say. I think it has affected how the UN thinks about things internally. 
but it's not a term that I would use for fear of igniting that sovereignty debate. I mean, I think what, another way of saying the same thing is how do you reduce violence? How do you build consensus yeah. to reduce violence? And that's, in a way, you're getting to the same place, but using a different language. More questions? Hands gone up right at the back and then here in the middle. So, the gentleman there, keep your hand up, sir. You started off uh, referring to the UN as a, quite a heavy machine. It's uh, uh, slow in doing a very important job. Is the U are the institutions of the UN evolving, or conversely, is there a demand for the UN uh, institutions to devolve uh, uh, against a changing demand for its services, practices, and its abilities? I'll ask Michael to answer the first part of your question because I had six years. Michael's had Michael's been in and out of the year, UN much longer. He can talk about the developments. But I could, what I would like to say, I would, would like to note is that Antonio Guterres, the new sec the Secretary General, who's been there now for what a year and a half, mm -hmm. a little bit more. He came from from a UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees. He was the High Commissioner for Refugees for ten years. The High Commissioner for Refugees has to deploy people quickly. You know, he, they're dealing with crises, whether it's whether it's a crisis over for natural or man or man-made disaster. They have to be nimble. They have to move quickly. He came to the Secretariat, and he he expected the same sort of responsiveness from the UN Secretariat that he had as High Commissioner for Refugees in an independent agency. He didn't find that. Um, so he has proposed, and member states have been largely supportive of a reform effort. There's, the UN goes through reforms every, you know, every few years, like many bureaucracies, but he's, he has proposed his reform effort based in part on his own experience as High Commissioner. So I have some confidence that he gets it, that the UN as a machine needs to be, to use my opening words, more nimble and more flexible. Part of this is self-imposed stuff. Typical bureaucracy, you know, bureaucracies impose rules on themselves that end up hamstringing operations. You know, they may do it for the right reasons, accountability of resources, but it ends up, it ends up hurting things. But part of it's member state. You know, that the 193 member states at the UN, in their wisdom, have imposed certain rules on, on how the UN does business. So Guterres is sincere in wanting to do reforms based on his own on his own experience, but I think he's also doing it for marketing, um, to show the world that this isn't your granddaddy's UN. You know that the that the UN it's, that the UN itself can evolve, that the UN can um, reinvent itself to be able to address um, the global challenges of today, not the global challenges of 1945. I, I, I'm we just run out of time. Yeah, I, I know we have, but I just. The, just keep your hand up. Just final question, just there. Hi, um, I'm Mohammed from uh, Somalia. Mm -hmm. Just want to take the opportunity to ask your question, uh, Mr. Michael. Uh, I recognize the progress of um, that the United Nations has contributed towards uh, towards my country. Um, a key a key challenge in Somalia is uh, is that problem of ownership. You know, Somali issues. Soma uh, so Somali solution to Somali problem. However, by saying that, uh, people that are powerful will have the upper hand compared to, to others. Um, what, what, what was your mitigation strategy in relation to that? And, and also, uh, 25 years of war, there is a huge um, uh, issue in terms of capacity building. Um, that's not only giving money and solving your problem, but institutional institutional creation and all, and all of that. And if you could just share what, what, what's happening in relation to that, please. Thank Thanks. you. Well, well, thank you. Great question. I mean, I think the mitigating strategy has to be insistence upon inclusivity uh, in all key discussions about the future of the country. Uh, to give you an example, the electoral process, one of the things that we did is support women and minority groups and young people to ensure that they had a role, not just as being part of the electorate, and as you know, the electorate was very small last time, I hope next time it's gonna be much bigger, but also on the institutions that organized the electoral process. Similarly, in looking at how the security forces are built or how the conversation about resources and revenue sharing takes place, the issue is how do you, on the one hand, 
get agreements among the power brokers because unless they are prepared to talk to each other. But then how do you make sure that women, young people, marginalized groups are meaningfully involved in these discussions, not out of some idealistic notion of, uh, you know, uh, uh, that is fanciful, because they won't work otherwise. And one of the things that I have learned about Somalis, if they do not think something is fair, it ain't going to work. And therefore, you have to try and support Somalis who are advocating for much more inclusive approaches. And if I can just pick up to end on one point, which is sort of tangentially relevant to what you asked, I mean, if there isn't a degree of respect for human rights, and if that isn't reflect reflected in very practical things, uh, like having women in the electoral uh, process, then the country's never going to sort its problems out. So one of the great values for us of having uh, uh, a special uh, rapporteur, we had the one on uh, dis internally displaced people, you know, and I think he's left a very frustrated person because he has wonderful discussions and then things don't happen. But actually, we use the in intelligence and information that he shares with us to then have discussions with the World Bank and the IMF and uh, international partners in how do you design very practical things. So just because you're not necessarily making a lot of noise about human rights doesn't mean that the information you get uh, on, uh, on human rights isn't then being actually hardwired into the discussions that we're having with the Somalis and with the international community in order to do some very practical things that are going to help the country sort its problems out. And I'm going to get into trouble for overrunning, but I think it was well worth having that question. Thank you for that question and for all of your questions. And thank you, Jeffrey Feltman and Michael Keaton.